So today's topic is Kubernetes uh, introduction to container orchestration. Um, Kubernetes is perhaps the hottest orchestration technology um, currently in cloud computing. Um, so um, just to put uh, some scope to our uh, discussion today, right? I'm going to assume that uh, the audience uh, has some basic knowledge about cloud computing and uh, like what cloud computing is and uh, its importance. Uh, also, um, I'm assuming that audience is somewhat familiar with the terms like what private cloud is, what public cloud is, and what hybrid cloud is, right? And just uh, to like simply uh, put uh, the definition across uh, cloud, uh, when we talk about cloud, uh, it stands on three pillars, right? Um, so compute, storage, and network. So uh, compute is the, the servers, that means your machines, either physical or virtual machines, where the load or the application runs. Uh, so compute provides the CPU and memory. Um, then the second pillar is network. Uh, it's the way how your multiple servers and the application would communicate with each other um, securely. And the third pillar is storage. So uh, it's a way to persist your huge amount of data that you may generate as part of your application or um, that is there on the cloud, right? Uh, so these are the three pillars of any cloud. Uh, now, this is the table of contents uh, and the agenda for today. Um, we'll briefly talk about the microservices architecture uh, that is used in application development. Um, and then we'll see uh, what containers are. Uh, I'll touch upon the basics of container technology and virtualization before we proceed. We'll then talk about the need to manage and orchestrate these containers and um, that is where Kubernetes uh, as an orchestration platform will come in picture. Uh, next, uh, we'll look at the basic concepts in uh, Kubernetes, um, its architecture, terminology used in the Kubernetes world, and then we'll uh, look at various ways to run uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we'll also uh, see a demo uh, wherein we would deploy very, very basic application um, like a student project, I would say. And we'll um, also like look at what are the related projects when it comes to Kubernetes. And um, uh, of course, uh, we'll see the current and future scope. And finally, we'll see what are the job opportunities if you study Kubernetes and you become expert in that, right? <clears throat> so uh, let's start with microservices. Um, so um, traditionally, uh, any applications or any software used to be monolithic, right? Um, which is like a single instance of an application. Um, so monolith application is any application that is not divided into smaller and independently deployable parts. So a monolith uh, is a big single unit. It may have um distinction like a front end and a back end uh, something like a ui and a database uh, but it would be so tightly coupled that you cannot independently deploy you cannot separate the two when you want to deploy the application you are deploying both parts simultaneously and uh, even if you modify one part of code the other part would get built again packaged again and a image would be formed again all right so um, that is what a monolith is. And, um, but of course, uh, splitting application was the need of the R, right? So when we the world started moving on to cloud, uh, the application had to be more dynamic. Um, the application had to be loosely coupled. The, the different parts of application had to be loosely coupled and uh, more fine grained, I would say highly cohesive, that means, one part of application should focus on one particular feature that the application might offer. And all these feature services, I would say, would has to be loosely coupled, right? So they shouldn't be much dependent on each other. So traditionally, when monolith applications mm -hmm. used to be there, the two or different mm -hmm. parts of application would talk to each other usually by method invocation, just like a, you call a function uh, in your code, right? Because it used to be one single whole code base, you could just call a different function uh, from different part of the code and that's how you would use that service. But now when 
we want to disintegrate the application into smaller independent parts, uh, method invocation is not um, the way. So that is where the APIs come in picture, right? So uh, because we are moving uh, to the cloud more and more, the requirements related to app development have, have been changing. So as I mentioned, application had to be more dynamic, the updates, to the application should reach the users or the end users rapidly, not like not like take three months that used to be there. Um, also, uh, an application when we say it can be huge application like uh, a web server or some shopping website or something like that. So multiple developers will be contributing, and all these developers should be able to independently build and test their part of code and not depend on each other. And if I change in the, let's say, database mm -hmm. part, I should be able to mm -hmm. just release the next version of the backend part and not have to deal with the front end. So that's what is meant by loosely coupled and highly coercive, right? Mm -hmm. So these mm -hmm. were the requirements so that different parts or different services can be updated and scaled. Scaling means whenever the requirements arise, whenever there is more need, uh, there is more demand, you, you should scale out your application right um, uh, and also avoid bottlenecks of a central database um, uh, used uh, traditional uh, monolith application used to have a central database and not different database for different features um, then the new uh, another requirement was to enable continuous ci cd now when we say ci cd it means continuous integration and continuous deployment that means as a as a developer if i deliver the feature today it should be immediately rolled out into production. It shouldn't take more than a few hours or a few days at max. Um, so these are the new requirements uh, when we move to cloud, right? So basically we had this monolith application uh, traditionally, and now this application is getting disintegrated or I would say getting divided into different parts, which are now called as microservices. Now all, um, yeah, so this is the um, graphical representation of how a monolith versus a microservice application look like. So there would be a user which would use your application and your application would have, so I am I have taken an example which is uh, very common and very easy to understand uh, any shopping website like Flipkart or Amazon, right? Uh, usually it would have different, um, different, I would say features or different, um, services that it provides like it would have some web ui it would have catalog of the items that it is hosting then it would have some payment section it would have a shipping section of course it would have a database at the back end where it will store all the information about all the orders all the items all the payments done so if it were a monolith application it would be a huge single instance and all these services would talk to each other by method invocation and there would be a single central database but that's not the way now the applications are built. They have moved to be uh, to the microservices architecture. So all these these components are now separate from each other. I can um, develop a front end part of it. I can easily do a my release of front end part. Uh, then there will be catalog service. Then there will be a payment service, shipping service. Each service will have its own database, and each of the services would talk to each other by calling the API. So each of the services would expose APIs that would be consumed by other services if they want to call that service. This is how a microservices application would look like. Now, all this is fine, but where do you put your microservices then? So that is where the container come in picture, right? So the rise of microservices architecture has caused increase in uses of containers um, because containers proved to be the perfect hosts for smaller, independent, and lightweight units uh, like microservices of an application. So um, each microservice, like we saw, it can be deployed in its own container. Uh, so an application uh, like a shopping website would easily deploy hundreds of uh, containers or it, it could actually easily have a myriad of uh, microservices and so ultimately hundreds of containers on which these microservices will run. So let's see what containers are. Definitely not a virtual machine, right? Um, now we'll have more uh, graphical view to distinguish between a VM and a container, um, but I would say uh, 
when it comes to vm mm. vm is more heavy weight and it it virtualizes the infrastructure uh, but when it comes to containers they are lightweight ephemeral immutable parts and they they virtualize the os rather than the infrastructure so when we say container it's actually a bundle which includes code code in the sense your business logic application logic that you have written your dependencies the libraries that you are using the binaries and the runtime whatever runtime your application would need to run right all that bundled together would constitute a container so to give you a more graphical view so left hand side is a vm right so you have your infrastructure when we say infrastructure it is uh, your actual physical server um your cpu your ram and all sort of things right um, then there is a hypervisor layer that sits on top of your infrastructure so that you can spawn different vms on top of it now each vm would think that the whole infrastructure is its own nobody else is using that infra that is how hypervisor gives impression of the infrastructure that means it virtualizes the infrastructure for vm and then vm will have its own guest operating system so a vm can run on red hat it can have ubuntu or solaris or what not the underlying infrastructure doesn't matter and then of course it would have its own libraries and bins and the application would be running inside the vm that's how a vm sits uh, on infrastructure but now when it comes to container you would of course have your infrastructure that means the physical server cpu ram you would have an operating system something like red hat or core os or anything that would be running on top of it and on top of that you will have something called as container runtime um like we have hypervisor in in case of vms we have something known as container runtime <coughs> to run your containers on top of operating system so if you see the container doesn't include the guest os part it just includes lib bin and the application logic so each container would assume that it is it's the only process that is running on the operating system so operating system is getting virtualized here by container runtime um <clears throat> so uh, just to define a container runtime right uh, container runtime um, a very famous example is docker uh, the application developers would write the core business logic but then somebody needs to take care of building then packaging and deploying that that logic onto the machine onto the operating system so container runtime usually does that for us so we just write the logic that we want to write and then building packaging and actually running that that code onto the operating system is taken care by container runtime so usually docker would uh, once you write some uh, code docker would take care of building packaging and creating an image of your application just like you you must have heard of jar files right something like that it would it would create an image and that image would be used to run the container on top of the operating system so this was just a brief about virtualization and containers and microservices architectures right so um this is fine we had a monolith initially now we moved to microservices architecture so now it's actually divided into all these microservices smaller smaller parts that are independent and you have containers that are hosting these microservices so basically all these containers are now running on the either vms or on physical servers but who will manage these containers so um it's fine if you just have one simple application like a hello world that that would be displayed on the browser and you just have one or two containers running but what happens if, when you have a production level um website like uh, we saw uh, a shopping website like amazon or flipkart or any other um files file sharing a service like a dropbox anything like a big production level application then you have different microservices um that are running on hundreds sometimes even thousands of containers then what happens to management of all these containers right so uh, you need a way or a tool that will take care of actually bringing up these containers for you managing them managing their life cycle um 
managing the communication between different containers. Uh, if you want to upgrade, let's say, to the next version um, of your software, then somebody should be able to do that for you. Somebody should be able to manage all the images of these containers for you. So when it comes to scale, you need some orchestration engine for that. Um, and that is all doing all these things is what a container orchestration tool would do for you. So these are the functionalities offered by container orchestration program, right? So it offers all these operations in a simpler way. So that means, um, let's say you had version V1 of your application running and now you want to move to next, next version is available, V2. You'll need to take down the current containers, current code, and then move to the V2 version on production, right? So at no time, the website would be down. The website would still be up, still be accessible by all the end users, but still you are upgrading to the next version. That there, That is where comes high availability. So there should be no downtime for the application. It should always be available to users. Somebody has to take care of that. Then there is resiliency. That means auto restarting or scaling of your containers. Let's say there is a festival time and a um, lot of people are actually doing a shopping online. So number of rec incoming requests have suddenly increased to rather than 100 to some thousands. So then you, your application shouldn't go down um, on the, um, because of that load. It should be uh, able to scale out. So if you, you are just running, let's say, two containers to handle the request, incoming request, you should now run 10 containers and somebody should do it for you dynamically without you manually spawning uh, another eight containers, uh, containers for that. So that is what container orchestration tool does for you. It takes care of scaling. It should scale up as well as scale down. So if the if the request suddenly shrink, if the number uh, if the load has um, uh, come down, then it should also scale down. That means it should uh, bring down the number of containers that you are running because you want to save on the uh, compute uh, capacity and uh, resources. Then there is disaster recovery. So, which means backup and restores. If something bad happens, like your data is lost or uh, your servers um, hosting the application go down, you should your application should still have the latest state. It should still have uh, be able to use all the latest information. Um, and Kubernetes would would do that for you. It would uh, provide the backup and restore facility to you and your application. Uh, then, of course, monitoring. Uh, so you need to um, you need some tool to monitor the health of your application, monitor the traffic maybe that is coming and going. Also, the security aspect, which means you you need um, to provide access within the application microservices and outside to, to the world securely. So somebody needs to manage all these certificates and security for you. All, all these are the um, services or functionalities provided by a container orchestration tool. So that is where Kubernetes comes in picture. So um, Kubernetes is open source container or orchestration tool. None of the companies own Kubernetes. It's all open source. Anybody can actually go and contribute. The code is available to the public and anybody can contribute to an open source project. Uh, how how did it start? So Google had an internal uh, project called Borg. Uh, Google wanted to manage their own. And they had large and huge infrastructures uh, located geographically um, apart, right? And they wanted some way to manage it efficiently. So they started a project called Borg inside uh, Google. And that was a very good project. So it was ultimately open sourced. And now it is known by the name of Kubernetes. Google doesn't own it anymore, it's open source. Uh, so Kubernetes helps manage application made, made up of thousands of containers, right? It provides all the facilities that we just saw. It supports deployments um, on various environments, like your, your containers would be running on virtual machines or any cloud virtual machines on your private data center or virtual machines on any cloud like AWS or uh, Google Cloud or uh, they could as well be running directly on a physical machine. It supports all the uh, environments. Um, 
it also supports uh, different container runtime so we just saw what a container runtime is like right so docker is the most um, commonly used uh, container runtime but it also supports any other container runtimes um, that are there so um, so we saw what kubernetes is now let's move on to its basic architecture so what kubernetes consists of right so uh, kubernetes is a cluster when we say cluster it means multiple of nodes working together uh, now when i say nodes it can be either vms that is virtual machines deploy deployed on physical servers or they can itself be physical servers it doesn't matter you can deploy kubernetes on either physical servers directly physical machines or on any of the vms but your uh, cluster would at least have one master node which would take care of controlling and managing and monitoring the cluster and the worker nodes which would actually host the application containers the containers would run on worker nodes right so worker nodes do the heavy lifting of running the apps actually and hence they are bigger in capacity in the sense they would have a little more cpu and more ram or more resources than master node master node just runs some handful of control plane processes but because it runs all the control plane processes we cannot afford to lose a master node so usually in production environment the master nodes are in um i would say in ha that means uh, there would be more than one master node deployed so that if one of the node goes down the other nodes can take up so basically this is um uh, what shows uh what goes on in master node and worker nodes um master node would make the scheduling decisions for application where the application containers would get scheduled which nodes it would manage the application it would monitor the overall health and overall system and do many other things and worker nodes would actually run the application processes and then there is something called a cni which means a container network interface uh it uh, for all your uh, containers and application needs to communicate with each other and with the outside world that that's how the application would get used and also these nodes have to talk to each other right mm. so cni that means container network interface would actually be responsible for ip management for routing between the nodes for any firewall settings and all the other things so basically there is a networking component and then there is a compute nodes uh, on which your kubernetes services will run and then ultimately on top of these nodes you would your application containers will run <clears throat> so if we zoom in uh, to the nodes these are the components of kubernetes itself right so on master node left uh, on left hand side you would see different services that constitute a master node in kubernetes and then on worker node as well uh, there are two services uh, that are part of kubernetes cluster all the yellow uh, boxes that you see uh, are part of kubernetes cluster uh, part of kubernetes installation itself and of course um, the other one uh, the cri is the docker or any container runtime uh that kubernetes will talk to and then we we, we do see something like a pod uh, uh we would uh, descri uh, describe what pod is in detail in uh, somewhat later slide uh, but uh, for now you can just assume that pod is equal to a container of course a pod can have more than one container running inside it uh but for now let's assume that it's a wrapper it's as good as a container that runs okay a pod is a basic schedulable unit um that is there in the kubernetes now kubernetes itself is microservices best so um kubernetes has its own uh microservices that are running so to access a cluster uh kubernetes cluster you can either use ui or cli or api rest apis and you would be talking to the tube api server uh, service right so this is the main service this is the uh, i would say heart of kubernetes because this is the service that that talks to any other service no none of the other services talk directly to each other every other service would go via kubernetes tube api server so even if you give any command for kubernetes cluster to kubernetes cluster it would first come to api server and then other actions would uh we taken upon uh, 
So API server is the heart. Uh, it's the primary management component. It exposes the uh, Kubernetes APIs uh, for managing the cluster, and it is responsible for orchestrating all operations in the cluster. Then there is something uh, called as Kube Scheduler. So Kube Scheduler is responsible for making scheduling decisions for application pods. So which pod should go on which worker node is decided by Kube Scheduler. Uh, mind you that Kube Scheduler doesn't itself go and start the pod uh, on the worker node. It would just make a decision and inform that decision to API server. API server then actually in contact the current corresponding kubelet process that we see here on the worker node. Mm -hmm. And then kubelet process would actually do the work of instantiating that pod on that worker machine and monitoring it. So Kube Scheduler just decides which worker node uh, uh, on uh, on which the pod would get scheduled and kubelet on that worker node the kubelet process would actually do the actual deployment of that pod and monitor and run it then there is something called as controller manager um, so kube controller manager is a daemon that uh, embeds the core control loops uh, that are shipped with the con uh, kubernetes so kubernetes has um, different objects um, like we saw node nodes are one of the objects in kubernetes or pods are one of the objects in kubernetes of course there are many more objects like replicate replication set so all these objects have one controller associated with it so node would have a node controller right a replication set would have a replication controller and uh, those controllers would manage those objects they would manage their life cycle so if a node goes down let's say our worker node goes down the node controller would come to know about it and it would take necessary action so all these controllers club together form a controller manager layer of kubernetes so basically controller manager is the control loop that would manage and control different objects within the kubernetes cluster uh, then the last part is etcd so etcd is a database um, and it's a key value store for the kubernetes so uh, any um, any information about the cluster any uh, configuration uh, that is used in the cluster any any data regarding pods application worker nodes networking is stored in the etcd key value store it holds the current state of the cluster it holds the config and status and data of the containers and nodes and kube api server would talk to etcd uh, only kube api server would talk to etcd for anything needed <clears throat> And then there is a last uh, service which is called Kube Proxy. It also runs on worker node. It doesn't run on the master node. Kube Proxy is a network proxy <clears throat> to ensure the communication between containers on different nodes. So if there are more than one worker node, um, all these pods running on different worker nodes should be able to ping to each other. So each pod has an IP associated to it, and pod one running on worker one, worker node one should be able to talk to pod two running on worker node two. And that happens via group Q proxy because that is the component that would <clears throat> take care of um, the IP and communication between the pods. It would also do some load balancing if we are using services. <clears throat> 